Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the shifting credibility of preventive war. This is a theory-based lecture that explores some of the issues that pop up in nuclear negotiations and cause the parties to fail to reach an agreement. In fact, I think that the narrative that I'm going to be describing to you here today is central to understanding what happened between the United States and the Soviet Union at the beginning of the Cold War. But we're just focused on the theory now, and we'll get to those empirics later on. So let's get to the theory. When we last left the theory of nuclear negotiations, we saw that even if one stacks the deck against deals working, the parties should still be able to reach an agreement. And in particular, even if the two parties are in a zero-sum security relationship, so that whatever one side gains on a policy dimension is implicitly an equal loss to the opposing side, deals still work. But we were also looking at nuclear negotiations in a sort of vacuum. So while we had a few components that are central to nuclear negotiations being held fixed, we were also making negotiations easy in some sense on other dimensions. And one of those dimensions is having a static preventive war capacity. So what we're going to be doing in this lecture is relaxing that assumption and see why bargaining might break down under those circumstances. And this is the focus of chapter six of Bargaining Over the Bomb. So if you're interested in some of the technicalities of what I'm describing here, check it out in the book. In the original model, we had the opponent begin by offering a concession. The potential proliferator could then accept that concession and not build nuclear weapons, reject the concession and fight a war under the status quo distribution of power, or build a weapon in response to the concession being given. And if the potential proliferator were to build, the opponent would have an opportunity to launch preventive war or not. And under that sort of framework, again, we saw that nuclear negotiations work. Because weapons are expensive, the opponent can offer an amount commensurate with the potential proliferator's ability to construct a nuclear weapon, and both sides are better off. But now we're going to modify the model to incorporate the concerns described earlier. First, if the potential proliferator accepts, instead of that just being the end of negotiations, we will repeat that bargaining period again. In other words, every single day, if we wake up and we make an agreement, then when we go to bed, what we'll be doing the next morning is renegotiating. If we don't have a shift in the ability to fight a preventive war, having this sort of repeated bargaining doesn't actually change what's going to happen in the model we would still have an agreement be made. But there's the rub. The other assumption that we're tweaking here is that the cost of preventive war for the opponent will decrease over time. In other words, if I fight a preventive war right now, it's going to be more expensive for me to do that than if perhaps I fight a preventive war two years from now. If we look back to the structure of the interaction, you might be able to see why a change in the cost of preventive war might cause some issues in nuclear negotiations. Think about what happens if the potential proliferator builds. At that point, the opponent is left with just two options. First, it can fight a preventive war to destroy the potential proliferator and not have to worry about a shift in the balance of power later on. Alternatively, the opponent can pass, accept the fact that the potential proliferator will now become a realized nuclear weapon state, and then ultimately make peace with that country, but have to give up more in concessions as a consequence. That's because to maintain the peace after nuclear weapons have been acquired, you must give a share of the policy that's commensurate with that state's share of the power. And now that the state has nuclear weapons, it has more power, and so you have to give more to that state to get that state to comply and avoid those costs of war. Remember that part of the calculation for the opponent about whether to prevent or not is how costly preventive war is. If preventive war is very costly, then the opponent will prefer to pass. If preventive war is cheap, then it will prefer to prevent instead. As a consequence, the potential proliferator's ability to extract concessions is in part determined by the opponent's cost of preventive war. 
Let's investigate a case where the opponent's ability to fight a preventive war will change massively over time. In other words, in the future, both the potential proliferator and the opponent realize that the costs of preventive war are going to be very small, and thus, in the future, if the potential proliferator has not yet built nuclear weapons, we would be in this situation where the power shift as a consequence of building nuclear weapons would be too hot. That is to say, the opponent would prefer fighting a preventive war than allow the potential proliferator to acquire nuclear weapons. So imagine that we reach this stage where the potential proliferator has not yet developed nuclear weapons, and we're so far into the future that the costs of preventive war are very low. Well, at this point, the potential proliferator is not going to get very much in the way of concessions. It can no longer credibly threaten to build nuclear weapons as a consequence of the opponent's cheap cost of preventive war. In turn, the opponent has no reason to offer nuclear-based concessions. It's not a credible threat to build. Diagramming this, if we're in the future where the cost of preventive war is very cheap and the potential proliferator has still yet to develop nuclear weapons, then the peaceful deal is not going to involve any nuclear concessions. That means that the opponent is going to get a very good share of the policy at stake, and the potential proliferator is not going to get very much. To be fair, it's not all bad for the potential proliferator, because they haven't built nuclear weapons, they haven't spent the money associated with those nuclear weapons, so they still have some cash on them. But nevertheless, if you're the potential proliferator and you care a lot about the policy that's in dispute, this is not a very good outcome for you. Now let's rewind to the present. Remember that we're investigating a situation where the change to the cost of preventive war is massive so that in the future, the situation may be too hot. But right now, it's not. And in fact, because the cost of war is relatively high currently, the opponent would prefer to allow the potential proliferator to acquire nuclear weapons rather than pay the cost of preventive war. So if the world were to stay static like this, and there wouldn't be any change to the cost of preventive war, what we would get is a peaceful deal with nuclear concessions, so that the opponent is taking less for itself and offering a more generous share to the potential proliferator to buy off the potential proliferator's compliance. Change that opportunity cost of developing nuclear weapons such that the net profit of doing so is gone. Indeed, if the potential proliferator were to build nuclear weapons at this point, it would only marginally change the policy outcome but cost the potential proliferator a great deal. The problem here, though, is that we are not living in a world where the cost of preventive war is static. It's changing over time. And so from the potential proliferator's perspective, they have a serious concern. It's true that they would prefer having a deal commensurate with their ability to produce nuclear weapons over the long term. The problem, though, is that the potential proliferator knows that that deal is not going to be stable in the long term. Once the opponent has the ability to fight a preventive war credibly because the costs of preventive war are low, the opponent has no reason to continue offering concessions. And at that point, the potential proliferator, while well, again, maybe saving a little bit of money, is going to be really hurt in terms of the policy in dispute. Whereas before they were getting a lot of it, and now, because they failed to develop a nuclear weapon, they are being shut out of it. And that's bad for the potential proliferator. As a result, the potential proliferator builds nuclear weapons while it can, that is, while the opponent has high costs of preventive war and is unwilling to intervene, precisely to lock in these concessions well into the future. This type of issue is known as a commitment problem. There are two components to that. First, the outcome that's actually occurring in practice is inefficient. And second, the efficient alternative is not possible because a party cannot credibly commit to the actions necessary to achieve it. Applying this to the case at hand, the opponent cannot credibly promise to give concessions into the future. It would love to do so. After all, the potential proliferator is building nuclear weapons because it knows that in the future, the opponent will cut the concessions. 
Unfortunately, there's not much the opponent can do to convince the potential proliferator otherwise. Everyone is well aware of the fact that once the opponent has a credible threat to launch preventive war, because the cost of preventive war is sufficiently low, then there is no reason anymore for the opponent to negotiate with the potential proliferator and offer nuclear weapons-based concessions. An interesting implication of this model is that it turns common narratives of nuclear negotiations on its head. If you live in the United States especially, you often hear that the main compliance concern about nuclear negotiations is that a country like Iran will not follow through in the long term. But we've seen that the promise not to build is credible as long as the concessions are going to keep coming. Instead, what's causing breakdown here is that the opponent, the state that's trying to offer the concession, can't credibly promise to continue those concessions in the long term. And absent that sort of long-term guarantee, we have a problem. Recapping, the opponent's inability to credibly commit to concessions over the long term makes the potential proliferator unable to credibly commit not to build nuclear weapons, which all causes negotiations to break down. And that's one reason why we might see bargaining fail, despite the fact that, in principle, there exist settlements that both sides prefer to nuclear proliferation. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.